Hi everyone, welcome to unit two. We are going to talk about fractions in this lecture. A fraction is a number that has two components, a part and a whole. A minute is one part of 60 minutes in a whole hour. So this relationship of part to whole can be shown in a fraction. One is called the numerator, and it represents the part of the whole, and 60 is called the denominator, and it represents the whole or the sum of the parts. You can write fractions vertically or horizontally. Another example would be two ounces is one part of 16 ounces in a whole pound. Take another common part to whole relationship. Many people sleep an average of eight hours a night. The relationship of sleeping hours to total days in a, to total hours in a day is eight to 24 or eight slash 24. So fractions are important to understand because you will come across many of them in the healthcare occupation. Fractions appear in medication doses, measurements, sizes of instruments, work assignments, and time units. Reading fractions on drug labels is a workplace necessity. Notice the 125 milligrams per 5 mLs on this label. This translates to 125 milligrams per milliliter as a fraction. If a drug says 125 milligrams per 5 milliliters, then this means that every, for every 5 milliliters of oral suspension, there is 125 milligrams of the drug in it. Okay, so sometimes you might be asked to figure out how many doses are available in one bottle. So here we have Tussin cough and chest congestion. And if you look way down in the bottom corner, you'll see that it contains 118 milliliters. So if a client needs two teaspoons or the equivalent would be 10 milliliters in each dose, do we have enough, all right? How many doses will we be able to give our patient? So if the client needs two teaspoons or 10 mLs in each dose, how many doses can we give? Well, if we were to take 118 and divide that by 10, then we would discover that there's 11.8 dosages. So the patient would be able to get 11 full doses. One might also be given an order for mixing a bleach disinfectant solution, let's say. Um, if the solution requires a half of cup of bleach per three quarters gallon of water, then we're going to need to mix a total of one and a half gallons of that cleaning solution, and we would use a fraction to set up that problem. So fractions are used in all sorts of measurements in healthcare. We use inches as well as the metric systems, centimeters, and millimeters. So understanding fractions can help healthcare workers make many different types of measurements from measuring cups to the length of a splint. Proper or common fractions are fractions with a numerator that is less than the denominator. For example, you see here 3 sevenths, 24 40 sevenths, and 9 elevenths. The value of any proper or common fraction is going to be less than one whole. Remember, we're saying we have a thing uh, that has seven parts 
and that to make a whole and the top number is telling us there's three parts so if you think of like when you get a pizza when you get a pizza there's eight pieces of the pizza and you eat two so to set up a fraction for that we would use two over eight or one fourth right of the pizza now mixed numbers are fractions that include both a whole number and a proper fraction for example three and three quarters 12 and 9 elevenths or 103 13 20 seconds now improper fractions are equal to one or larger that means it is the whole plus some extra right one pizza plus some extra pieces maybe we have um, eight pieces of pizza and then two more so 10 over 8 right so we have more than one whole pizza if we had 10 eighths improper fractions are used in the multiplication and division of fractions answers that appear as improper fractions need to be reduced so that the answer is a mixed number all right but we'll get to that in a little bit So understanding equivalent fractions is important in making measurement decisions. Equivalent fractions represent the same relationship of part to whole, but there are more pieces or a variation of the parts to the whole. So if you sliced a pizza again into eight pieces and then decided to cut each eighth in half, you would have sixteenths, not eighths so one pizza changed the number of pizzas from eight eighths to sixteen sixteenths but yet they still represent one pizza does this make sense both fractions involved are equivalent or equal in value the size of the pieces or parts is what's going to vary you could keep cutting up this pizza and even it into even smaller parts similarly if you had two pieces of that eight slice pizza, you would have two eighths, or like I said before, one fourth. And if you decided to cut each piece in half, you then have a 16 slice pizza, and you would have four slices of it, four sixteenths, instead of two slices of eight, you would have had four slices of 16. So enough about pizza, all this talk about pizza has got me wanting to eat pizza, I don't know about you guys. But how do we create an equivalent fraction? Well the way we do this is we simply multiply both the numerator and the denominator by the same number. For example, if we have uh, the equation 1 6 equals 3 18 why why does it equal that well we multiplied the 1 by 3 giving 3 and the 6 by 3 giving us 18 so as long as we multiply the top and the bottom by the same number we get an equivalent fraction what if we would have chosen 2 and we multiplied the 1 by 2 and the 6 by 2 we would still get an equivalent fraction of 2 twelfths So the size of the pieces or parts it what is what varies and that is shown in the figures that you see here. The shaded areas are the same size. Can you see that the one on the left is divided into two equal parts where the one on the right is divided into eight equal parts. So the numbers of the parts vary but both of these are referring to half of a pizza. So two large pieces and we've, we're eating one, we would be eating one of two pieces. It's still, it's half, right? On the other one, if we eat half, we're eating four pieces of a total eight. So we say we would have eaten four eighths of an entire pizza. I thought we were going to get away from pizza. 
We can also solve for an unknown using fractions. We first see it written in words. What over 18 equals one over six? Then we're gonna write it horizontally and vertically. So the key to getting the correct answer is remembering that the number the denominator is multiplied by must be also used to multiply the numerator. You can do it in your head, right? Or if this method is difficult for you, then divide the smaller denominator six into the larger one, 18. Your answer is three. Well, so then you'll take three and multiply that by the first numerator to get the second numerator. So then we get the six, uh, the six becomes an 18, right? What did we multiply six by to get 18? That's a good question we can ask ourselves, right? And once we determine it's three times six that equals 18, then we just multiply our top number by that number that we found and we get three. Easy peasy. Reducing to lowest or simplest terms. As in making fractions equivalent, reducing fractions to their lowest or simplest terms is another important fraction skill. Most tests and practical applications of fractions require that the answers be in the lowest terms. Lowest terms mean that the fraction is in the lowest proper fraction possible and can be reduced no further. For example, four eighths is not reduced to its lowest terms. However, one half is reduced to its lowest terms. So after each calculation of addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, you will need to reduce the answer to its lowest terms. So there's two methods that will help you find the lowest terms, the multiplication method and the division method. So how do you decide which one to use? Well, choose your stronger skill. Are you more comfortable with multiplying or are you more comfortable with dividing? And then use it to reduce your fractions. You'll make fewer errors this way if you select one method and use it consistently. So let's go over both of those next. To use the multiplication method, first look at the numbers in the fraction. Find a number that divides into both the numerator and the denominator evenly. Such numbers are called factors. Remember when we did prime factoring. So these are called factors of the numbers. Write out the multiplication for the numerator and the denominator. Then you're going to cross out the two identical numbers in the multiplication problems. What is left will be the reduced fraction. Depending on the multiple you choose, you may also need to reduce the fraction. Here's a tip. Choose the largest possible multiple to avoid having to repeat the steps in the reduction. So let's work through an example. Here we're going to reduce 8 24 So first we write the fraction vertically. You can see it here on the far left, 8 over 24. Let's find a number that divides into 4 evenly, or divides into both evenly and that number is 4. So we're going to write out the multiplication. We'll cross out the identical numbers and we're going to get 2 over 6. So you see here we did 4 times 2 on the top, that equals 8, right? And 4 times 6 gives us 24, so we cross out both fours on the top and bottom because they're the same they can go away and we're left with two over six is this reduced as far as it can go is there another number that will go into both two and six evenly and yes there is right it's a two 
So we'll go ahead and perform the step again, doing 2 times 1 in the numerator and 2 times 3 in the denominator, because 2 times 1 equals 2, and 2 times 2 equals 6, and then we're going to cross out the matching numbers on the top and bottom, and that leaves us with 1 third. Is this as low as it can go? Yes. Awesome. So let's take a look at the division method. Look at the numbers in the numerator and the denominator. First, you'll choose a number that divides into both the numerator and the denominator, and then next, we're going to divide the numerator and denominator by that number. So let's check to ensure that the resulting fraction is in its lowest terms after we perform those operations. So let's work through an example. Here we're going to reduce 2 sixteenths. So this is just another way of reducing, right? There's the multiplication method of reducing, and now we're going over the division method of reducing. So we're going to choose a number that divides into both the numerator and the denominator. Here we're, we chose the number 2. So 2 divided by 2 for the numerator, and 16 divided by 2 for the denominator. And when we perform that math, we get 1 over 8. And this fraction is reduced to its lowest terms. So let's look at that one that we did before, 8 24ths. And let's use the division method this time instead of the multiplication method. So let's first choose a number that divides into both the numerator and the denominator. And here we're choosing 4. 8 will div uh, be divided by 4, and 24 can be divided by 4. So when we write that out and we perform the operation, we get 2 sixths. Now, is 2 sixths the lowest um, terms? No, it's not. So we have to keep going, so let's repeat the steps. So we set up the next equation, 2 will divide into 2 evenly, right? And 6 divides uh, by 2 evenly. And when we perform those operations, we get the same answer that we got when we used the multiplication method of 1 third, and that is uh, in the lowest possible terms. So here's a little setup hint for the division method. Set aside the whole number, reduce the fraction, and then place the whole number next to the fraction. Okay, we're going to look at that here in a, coming up in a second. Like we mentioned before, fractional parts or relationships are a common thing in healthcare. So let's take a look at some real world examples. The first one is in a nursing class of 30 people, 13 students are male and 17 of them are female. So we're going to write a relationship here. So we place the part 13 over the whole, which is 30, or the total number of students. To write the relationship of females to the total number of students, we place the part, which is 17, there's 17 female students out of 30 over the whole, and let's ask ourselves, are both fractions reduced? And the answer is yes, they are. So let's take a look at another example. This one says, about 500 medicine cups are used daily at a long-term care facility. The nurse claims that approximately 4,000 medicine cups are used each week. What is the day-to-week use rate of medicine cups? So if we put 500 cups a week over 4,000 cups a month, that gives us 500 over 4,000. Now, is this fraction reduced? No, it's not. 
we would be able to reduce that, right? Now let's look at improper fractions. An improper fraction has a larger numerator than the denominator. Either whole numbers or mixed numbers and is used for dividing mixed numbers. So, for example, 16 over 8, or 23 over 21, or 547 over 23. Those are some examples of improper fractions. So to reduce an improper fraction, what we're going to do is divide the denominator into the numerator and then see what we have left over. What we have left over is called the remainder, remember when we do a division problem, and we're going to place that over the divisor to form a fraction. So let's look at 11 over 8. If we perform the operation of dividing 8 into 11, we're going to get 8 goes into 11 one time and then we have 3 left over. So this would become 1 and 3 eighths. So now that we've learned to reduce fractions, let's move on to talking about adding fractions with like denominators. Addition of fractions with the same denominators is pretty straightforward and we follow two basic steps. So the first step is going to be to line up the fractions however you can best work with them. You can line them up vertically or horizontally like you see here. So whichever one makes more sense to you and then you're only going to add the numerators. You're not going to add the denominators. Those are the same. We're not going to mess with those at all. So here, in this problem, we have 3 6 plus 2 6, and we're going to add those together. And when we add 3 plus 2, we get 5, and then we place that over the denominator. We keep it the same, right? So that gives us 5 6, okay? And let's ask ourselves, before we move forward, can we reduce that? And no, we can't. So uh, we're good here. So what if our answer is an improper fraction when we get done adding it? All we have to do is simply reduce it. And we learned how to reduce an improper fraction, right? All we have to do is divide the denominator into the numerator. So let's look at this problem here. We have 4 eighths plus 5 eighths. We're going to add the 4 and the 5 and that gives us 9 and we're just going to scoot our denominator over. It's the same. We don't have to mess with it. But then we just do a quick check to see if it's reduced and we notice that the numerator is bigger than the denominator. And this leaves us with an improper fraction. So we're going to divide the 8 into 9 and that goes one time, right? And then we have one left over. And so that is going to become our new fraction over the denominator, which is 8. So we put the remainder over 1, that gives us 1 8, and then our whole number, which is 1, right? And then we reduce our fraction and we're good to go. So what if we need to add mixed fractions? If a whole number goes with the fraction, then we're going to simply add it separately and place the fraction next to the whole number. Easy peasy, right? The whole number will be affected only if the fraction answer is larger than 1. So in that case, the whole number resulting from the fraction addition is added to the whole number answer. So let's look at this example. We have 14 and 2 eighths plus 7 and 1 eighth. Now our, denom our denominators are the same, so we're going to leave those alone right? We're going to add our fractions, okay? Or you could add the whole numbers first if you would like to. Um, we're going to add our fractions, which is the 2 and the 1, and that gives us 3 eighths. 
and then we're going to simply add the 14 and the 7 and that gives us 21 and our new answer is 21 over 3 eighths and then we just need to quickly ask ourselves can we reduce this number at all and the answer is no we can't so let's look at the operations of that a little more closely so here we are um, like we talked about on the last slide, we're using that same problem of 14 and 2 eighths plus 7 and 1 eighths. So let's add the fractions first. 2 plus 1 is 3, and then we just scoot our denominator over. And then we add our 14 plus 7, we get 21. And then we put it all together, we assemble it, and we get 21 and 3 eighths. And then we just do that double check to make sure that it doesn't need reducing, and it doesn't, and so this is our final answer. All right, so let's look at another example of adding mixed fractions. Here we have 10 and 2 fourths plus 4 and 3 fourths. So I'm going to give you a second or pause the video and work this one out and then we'll go through the steps on the next slide. Okay, so to perform the addition of these two mixed fractions, we're first going to add the fractions. Remember we had 2 fourths and 3 fourths. So when we add 2 plus 3 we get 5 and we're just going to scoot that 4 all the way over in the denominator and leave it the same. Okay, and that gives us 5 fourths. Then we're going to add the whole numbers, which is 10 and 4, and that gives us 14. So when we assemble it, we get 14 and 5 fourths. Now let's just look at this and make sure that it's okay. All right? You might have noticed that the numerator is bigger than the denominator in our fraction. So we're going to set the 14 aside, okay, for a second, and we're just going to deal with the 5 over 4. Remember we said to reduce an improper fraction, we're going to divide the 4 into the 5, right? It goes one time, and that's going to give us a remainder of 1, and we're going to set that up as our fraction. 1 over 4. Now what do we do with that 1 that we just made? Well, we have to add it to the 14, right? Because it became a whole number. So we do 14 plus 1 gives us 15. And now we reassemble our answer and we get 15 and 1 fourth. So adding and subtracting fractions requires that the denominator be the same number. And we've been working with denominators of the same number to do addition. Uh, so uh, when the denominators are the same, we refer to this as the common denominator. Now the lowest common denominator is the smallest number or multiple that both of the denominators of the fraction can go into. So let's look at an example of finding the lowest common denominator. Let's add 2 thirds and 1 sixth. So let's line it up vertically so that we can see the numbers and their relationships more easily. First we need to get both fractions to having the same common denominator. Using multiplication, let's find the smallest number or multiple that the numbers can go into. Now in the problem, three, 3 and 6 are the denominators. So 3 times 2 equals 6. So 6 is the common denominator because 3 and 6 go into 6, right? So we multiply 2 thirds by 2 over 2, right? And uh, we get 4 sixths. All right, we get 4 sixths. Now, both denominators are the same, and we can go ahead and add them up. And when we add them up, 4 sixths plus 1 sixth, we get 5 sixths. 
So sometimes we have to consider a wider range of possibilities uh, when we're finding a common denominator. So for example, you may have a pair of fractions in which one of the denominators cannot be multiplied by a number to get to the other denominator. So in this case, the easiest way is simply to just multiply the two denominators and come up with a new number. And uh, this will be your new common denominator. So here we have 3 thirteenths plus 1 fourth and what we did was we multiplied 13 and 4 and that gave us 52. So 52 is going to be the new common denominator, right? So when we do that, we have to also multiply the top numbers, right? Uh, the numerators by that same number. And so that's going to give us, when we multiply 3 thirteenths by 4 on both the top and bottom, we're going to get 12 50 seconds, and then we got to multiply the 1 fourth by 13 on the top and bottom. Remember, whatever we do to the, the denominator, we have to do to the numerator as well. All right, so that's going to give us 13 50 seconds. And then we're just going to go ahead and add them up like normal. 12 plus 13 gives us 25, and we end up with 25 50 seconds, which is in its lowest reduced form. All right, so let's talk a little bit about ordering fractions. Remember when we use those greater than and less than signs? So that's what we're going to be doing here, okay? So different healthcare fields require the comparisons of fractions. So for example, you might need to compute sizes of medical items or pieces of equipment. So it's useful to be able to determine the size relationships of instruments and then place them in order for a surgeon before surgery. So this is accomplished by using the common denominator method. And in order to compare numbers, um, again, you'll need to understand or review the less than, greater than, and equal signs. And so here they are again for you. In the first example, remember I said the big, the mouth eats the big number, and so we have 3 is less than 4. In the second example, 7 is greater than 5. And then the last one, 2 over 2 equals 1, right? Because that could, 2 can divide into 2 one time, and that gives us 1. So let's look at ordering these fractions. So here we have 1 fourth or 3 eighths. How do we know which one is larger? So the way that we do this is first we're going to find a common denominator. And the way that we do that is we look at the 4 and the 8 and we're like, okay, is there a common multiple that we can multiply 4 by to get to the same denominator as 8? And there actually is, right? It's 2. So we have to multiply the numerator and the denominator of 1 fourth by 2. And when we do that, we get 2 eighths. Now it's easier for us to look at 2 eighths and 3 eighths and determine which one is larger. So 3 eighths is greater than 2 eighths, or 2 eighths is less than 3 eighths. Okay, so now we're going to move on and talk about subtraction of fractions. Subtraction of fractions follows the same basic principles as addition of fractions. We must make sure that both fractions have a common denominator before we can do any subtraction. So let's look at an example. The first one is 7 over 8 minus 2 over 8. The denominators are the same, so we simply subtract the 7 and the 2, and we get 5 over 8. In the second example, we have 3 ninths minus 2 ninths. 
The denominator is the same, so you don't have to worry about messing with that. We're just simply going to subtract 2 from 3, and that gives us 1 ninth. And both of those are reduced, so we don't have to do anything else there. Our last example, you'll notice that we're now looking at a mixed number. And so you can still set this up vertically, or you can set it up horizontally if that makes more sense to you. But we're simply going to subtract, and first let's start with the fractions, all right? Let's look at them. They both have a common denominator, right? So that works out. We're going to subtract 1 from 3, and that gives us 2 fourths. And then we're going to subtract our whole numbers now, uh, 25 minus 20, and that gives us 5. And so our answer is 5 and 2 fourths. Now let's just look and see if it could be reduced. Well, it could, right? Because 2 fourths is not in its most reduced form. A 2 could be divided into both the numerator and the denominator. So we go ahead and perform that operation, and our final answer is 5 and 1 half. All right, sometimes when we're doing subtraction, remember when we were working with whole numbers and we had to borrow sometimes? Well, the same can happen when we're subtracting. Two specific situations require that a number be borrowed in the subtraction of fractions. The first one is when we're subtracting a fraction from a whole number. And the second is after a common denominator is established and the top fraction of the problem is less than or smaller than the fraction being subtracted from it. So remember, any number over itself equals 1. So if we have 1, it could be a 1,000 over a 1,000, it could be a bazillion over a bazillion, it could be 2 over 2, it could be 12 over 12. Any number over itself equals 1, right? Because remember, we said the denominator is the whole. How many parts in the whole and the top number, the numerator, is the parts of that whole, right? So if we have a pizza and it's cut into 12 pieces, the whole thing is 12 pieces. We're going to put 12 on the bottom, right? Now, let's see, say we ate six pieces. We would have six twelfths or one half, right? But if we ate all 12 pieces, then we would have eaten 12 out of 12 pieces. That means we ate the whole pizza. We ate the whole pizza, okay? So the, the second thing to remember is that subtracting requires common denominators, just like addition does, all right? So we're gonna look at the problem 17 and 3 eighths minus 14 and 4 eighths. So we're going to work that out on the next slide. Okay, so remember we said that our problem is going to be 17 and 3 eighths minus 14 and 4 eighths. And we can either set this up vertically or horizontally, whichever works best for you. I find that subtracting fractions is easier for me if I work vertically and set one on top of the other like a regular subtraction program but a uh, problem but whatever works for you is fine so when we set this up we see that 4 eighths is bigger than 3 eighths and so we're not going to be able to perform that operation it would be like so, saying 3 minus 4 right and we can't do that we would have to borrow so in this case we're going to have to borrow from the 17 so now right now we're just working with 17 and 3 eighths so we're going to borrow 1 from the 17 and that makes it 16 and we already said any number over the same number is a whole so 8 over 8 would equal 1 whole. So we're going to add 3 eighths and 8 eighths, right? Then that's going to give us now 16, because we had to borrow 1 from the 17, right? 16 and 11 eighths. And now we can go ahead and perform that operation. We'll subtract 4 from 11, 
and that gives us 7. The denominator stays the same, so we place that underneath the 7, and then we subtract 14 from 16, and that gives us 2. And then we just do a quick double check and make sure that we don't need to reduce anything, and 7 eighths is in its lowest reduced form, and so we are good to go. This is our answer. So a quick little borrowing setup hint. Some subtraction rules to remember. First, we must have a common denominator when we're subtracting, just like addition, right? The second thing is to borrow from a whole number, we make it a fractional part, right? So um, the next thing is we add the fractional parts, okay? and then we subtract and we reduce if we need to. To facilitate multiplication of fractions, let's set up the problem horizontally. One of the simplest computations in fractions is multiplying a common fraction. So all you have to do is multiply straight across just regular multiplication, no common denominator is needed. It's really simple. And then the last part we have to remember is just to reduce if necessary. So let's look at the problem 7 eighths times 1 fourth. So when we set that up horizontally, we can perform the problem working on the numerator first. 7 times 1 is 7, and 8 times 4 is 32. So that gives us 7 30 seconds, and then we just have to look and see if it is reduced uh, to its lowest form, and it is, so we don't need to do that. So let's go over some important things to remember. We'll need them in the next section. So first, any number over itself equals 1. Whether it's 8 over 8, 128 over 128, or 14 over 14. In addition to that, any numerator with a denominator e that equals 1 is a whole number. So for an example, 4 over 1 equals 4, 6 over 1 equals 6, because 1, there's just one part, right? We have that pizza, and we didn't cut it into any pieces, right? So 1 would go into 4 four times. That gives us a whole number, right? A couple other examples, 51 over 1 equals 51 holes, or 102 over 1 equals 102 holes. In addition to that, any whole number can become a fraction by placing a 1 as its denominator. So if we have a whole number 14, we can place a 1 underneath it and it becomes a fraction, right? The 1 is just kind of assumed, right? Just like if we have 14 without a plus sign, we assume that it's a positive number. So to multiply a fraction by a whole number, we're going to follow these steps. So step one is we're going to make a whole number into a fraction by placing one under its, under its numerator, right? So a one is going to be the denominator. So here we have an example of one-sixth times two. So now we're going to place a one underneath that two, and it gives us one-sixth times 2 over 1. And all we have to do is multiply those straight across, and it gives us 2 sixths. And then we have to ask ourselves, is 2 sixths in its most reduced form? And no, it is not. 2 will divide into 2 once, and 2 will divide into 6 three times, so we can reduce that to 1 third. So when multiplying, you can ex expedite your work by reducing before you multiply. Now you don't have to do this, okay, but you can. It will make less work on the end, but more work in the beginning. This is useful because it relies on the multiples of the numbers to reduce the numbers that you are multiplying. 
It saves time at the end of the problem, like I said, because you won't have to spend too much time reducing your answer. So if a numerator can go into a denominator number evenly, then canceling is possible, all right? Reducing first using canceling can save time by allowing you to work with smaller numbers. But you don't have to, you can reduce at the end, like I said. So let's work through the example of multiplying two-fifths by three-fourths. So let's cancel first. The two can go into the four twice because two times two equals four, and then you can't cancel, cancel out the three or the five. So remember, we're working uh, diagonally, right, to do our canceling. Um, so if we do that, then we multiply straight across um, one times three and five times two, and that gives us three tenths. And then we just have to ask ourselves, can three tenths be reduced? And no, it cannot. Now let's look at the problem if we did not cancel. If we just do the regular multiplication straight across, we end up with six twentieths, all right? And then we would need to reduce. So two would be a good number to reduce by. Two goes into six and into 20. 2 goes into 6 3 times, and 2 goes into 23 times, and that leaves us with our same answer. So whichever way you feel comfortable, you can do this problem either way. So sometimes there's more complicated canceling. For more complicated problems, it might be easier to do the cancel canceling by writing out the numbers that are involved. Um, and you don't... you. You don't have to do this. You can arrive at the same answer by just multiplying straight across, right? And then getting uh, the answer and reducing it. Um, but here in this example, we write out the multiples of each number to find numbers that can go into it evenly. So we would begin by crossing out the matching numbers, working from top to bottom and, across, and crossing them out um, when they're the same. So we cross out the matching numbers. Then we're gonna multiply the remaining numbers straight across. So let's work through this problem. We have 10 fifteenths times three one hundredths. All right, so you can see across the top, we figured out our multiples, 10 times one and three times one, and then we did the same on the bottom. Three times five is 15 and 10 times 10 is 10. So then we look and see which ones we can cancel out. We can cancel two tens and we can cancel two threes. All right, and you can see how we canceled the 10 at the top and the 10 at the bottom and then the three at the bottom and the three at the top. So we're still working diagonally in, if you want to think of it as that each line of that multiplication sign, we're working diagonally, all right? And so you can see how we canceled out the 10 on the top and the 10 on the bottom, the three on the top and the three on the bottom. So then let's look at the numbers that we have left. We'll circle them. There's a one and a one on the top and there's a five and a 10 on the bottom. So when we multiply straight across, we get one times one equals one and five times 10 equals 50. And that cannot be reduced any further. And so we are good to go. That's our final answer. When there are two or or when there are more than two fractions, reducing fractions can occur anywhere within the fraction as long as the reducing is done in the top and bottom numbers. So there can be multiple reductions of fractions as well. So we'd set up the problem horizontally and write out the factors for each, reduce by canceling, and then multiply. So let's work through an example. We have 11 sixteenths times three twelfths times eight sixty sixths. Now we're gonna go ahead and write out the factors for each number. Remember when we did factoring? Okay, so we're gonna go across the top and then we're gonna go across the bottom. So for 11, we have 11 times one. For three, 
we have 3 times 1, and for 8, we have 2 times 4. Okay, now let's look at the bottom. For 16, we can multiply 8 by 2 to get 16. For the 12, we can multiply 4 by 3. And for the 66, we can multiply 6 times 11. Now let's look at the top number and see if there's one we can cancel out on the bottom. Well, there is. Look at the 11 in the top. There is 11 on the bottom underneath the 66. So we could go ahead and cancel those out. Now look at the 3. There's a 3 on the top in our factoring and a 3 on the bottom. So we could go ahead and cancel those out. Now let's look at the, the 2. There's a 2 on the top and a 2 on the bottom. We could cancel those out. And there's also a 4 on the top and a 4 on the bottom, and we could cancel those out. So then we simply circle what we have left. We have a 1 and a 1 on the top, and we have an 8 and a 6 on the bottom. So when we multiply 1 times 1, we get 1. And we multiply 8 times 6, we get 48. And can that be reduced any further? No. So this is our final answer. Now let's talk a little bit about mixed numbers. Remember, mixed numbers are whole numbers with a fraction attached to it. Multiplication involving mixed numbers requires that the mixed number be changed into an improper fraction. We can't multiply mixed numbers, right? We can only multiply in their fraction form. So let's talk about how we get a mixed number into a fraction. So there's a couple steps we have to perform. So the first step is we're going to multiply the whole number times the denominator, and then we're going to add the numerator. All right, so our example here we're going to start with 1 and 3 quarters, and we're going to multiply the 1 times the 4 and then add 3, right? Because the, the whole number 1 is really 4 over 4, right? 4 over 4. Okay, so we're going to multiply 1 times 4, and then we're going to add the remainder, which is 3, all right? And that gives us 7. 1 times 4 is 4 plus 3 is 7, and so now we're going to keep that same denominator, and we're going to have 7 fourths. If we were to reduce that, then we, we could check to see if our work was correct, right? How many times does 4 go into 7? 1, and there's 3 left over, right? So that's the way that we get a mixed number into a fraction. All right, so let's work through this example of multiplying mixed numbers. Our problem is 1 over 3 times 5 and 1 fourth. So 1 third times 5 and 1 fourth. All right, and we have a problem because the 5 and 1 fourth is a mixed number, and we need to get that into a fraction. So remember what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the whole number 5 by the denominator 4, which gives us 20, and then we're going to add the remainder, the numerator. That gives us 1. Right, so that's 21 fourths, right? Five times four plus one is 21. That gives us 21 fourths. Okay, we changed it. Now it's really simple. All we have to do is our count canceling and then we can multiply straight across, right? So let's rewrite the problem as one third times 21 fourths and then we're gonna do some reduction and we're gonna write out the factors first. All right, so, um, Factoring 1 is really just 1 times 1, so we, we don't do anything with that. And then let's look at the 21. We can multiply 7 and 3 to get 21. All right, so that's our factors there. And then let's look at the bottom. 3 times 1 is going to be 3. So let's look at the top and see if there's any of the same numbers in our factors at the top as there are at the bottom. And there is. It's a 3. So we can cancel that out, circle the ones that are left, right? And so that, uh, if we rewrite that, we get 1 times 7 and 1 times 4, right? So 1 times 7 in the numerator equals 7, and 1 times 4 in the denominator equals 4, and we are going to get our answer of 7 fourths, and that can be reduced, right? We're going to look at it. It can be reduced. 4 will go into 7 once. That gives us 1 as our whole number, and then we have 3 left over. So 1 
and 3 fourths is going to be our answer. It can't be reduced any further. Okay, moving away from multiplication, we're going to talk about division of fractions. And so when we divide fractions, we have to do something called taking the reciprocal. And the reciprocal means it's inverse. So we're going to turn that fraction on its head. All right, so if we have two thirds, the reciprocal would be three halves. You see how we just flipped it around? We just turned it upside down. That's the reciprocal. Another example, if we have 12 30 fifths, the reciprocal of that would be 35 twelfths. And then the last example, if we have 9 thirteenths, then that would be 13 ninths. So it's important that we understand inverses so that we can learn how to properly divide fractions. So to, to, to divide fractions, two steps are going to be needed to compute the answer. So let's um, remember the first thing we're going to do is change the division, division sign to multiplication. And then we're going to invert the fraction to the right. We're going to reciprocal the fraction, right? Okay, so let's take an example. Uh, we have a problem here of 1 8th divided by 1 4th. Okay, so we're going to change the division sign to a multiplication sign. And then we are going to reciprocal the fraction to the right of the multiplication sign. This gives us 1 8th times 4 over 1, and when we multiply that, we get 4 eighths. Now let's ask ourselves, can we reduce that? Yes, 4 goes into itself once, and 4 goes into 8 twice, so that is going to leave us with 1 half, and that's its most reduced form. So fractions are also useful in converting between measurement systems. And one example of this is from Celsius, abbreviated C, to Fahrenheit, abbreviated S. So these are two different types of temperatures. Fractions are more accurate than decimals when we're doing these types of conversions. But in unit three, we will go over the decimal conversion as well. So these are the two handy dandy formulas that we would use for converting Celsius to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to Celsius. Now you see in each of these equations that there are uh, part of the equation is set apart by parentheses. And that means that we would perform those operations first. This is called the order of operation. So we would do whatever work we needed to do within those parentheses before we finish the rest of the problem. Okay, so let's work through a couple examples. The first example, we're going to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit. And we know that Celsius is five degrees and we want to find out what the Fahrenheit is. So let's work through that. So we see our equation is Celsius times nine fifths plus 32. That's gonna give us our Fahrenheit, all right? So we know what Celsius is, so we're gonna plug that in for the C right, the unknown in the problem, and we get five times nine fifths. Now, remember that whole number is like five over one. So if it helps to rewrite this as five over one times nine over five, um, go ahead and do that. And then we're gonna multiply straight across, that gives us 45 over five, because five times nine is 45, and five times one would be five, and then we can reduce that, right? Five goes into 45 nine times, exactly. So then, now we have the work done in that, um, in those parentheses, and we're gonna go ahead and finish the rest of our problems. So nine plus 32 gives us our 41 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so let's look at converting Fahrenheit to Celsius. We're gonna do that now. We're gonna use the other equation. So remember that equation, equation for finding Celsius because we know Fahrenheit is Fahrenheit minus 32 
times 5 over 9. We took the reciprocal of 9 fifths. Okay, um, and that's going to give us our Celsius, our degrees in Celsius. So we're going to plug in what we know, which is 122. On the previous slide, we said it was 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and we wanted to find Celsius. So if we plug in 122 uh, in for the F, and that's in parentheses, so we need to do that first. That's going to be 122 minus 32, and if we do that math, we get 90. And then we're going to go ahead and add that to the rest of our problem. Now remember the 90 is the same as saying 90 over 1, right? So we're going to do multiplication. 90 times 5 gives us 450. And the 9 times 1 would give us 9. And 9 goes into 450 50 times. So that would give us our Celsius of 50 degrees. All right, so we've talked about how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide fractions. We've also talked about how they can be helpful in conversions um, between units like Celsius and Fahrenheit. So let's look a little bit more regarding some complex fractions, all right? So complex fractions are used to help nurses and pharmacy techs compute exact dosages of medication. A complex fraction is a fraction within a fraction. They may also more effectively solve difficult problems. So an example would be some doctors and pharmacists continue to use grains as a measurement in their prescriptions, even as the industry has converted to the use of milligrams and micrograms in dosages. A typical problem may be that a doctor prescribes one eighth of a grain, but the supply on hand is one sixth of a grain per milliliter. So this setup would be a, co a complex fraction, and we would set this up as one eighth grain over one sixth grain times one ml, right? So complex fractions are solved by using the rules of division. So here you see two examples of complex fractions. They're both, they're both written horizontally and vertically, and additionally in words, right? One quarter divided by six and three quarters divided by one one hundredth, okay? The fraction bars, the lines in between, separate the fractional parts, numerator and denominator, um, and should be viewed as a division sign. So let's work through these examples. All right, so the fraction bars, again, are separating the fractional parts, the numerator and the denominator, and again, we said these should be viewed as a division sign. Okay, so let's work through solving this complex fraction. So the, in the first problem, we have 1 fourth divided by 6. So the first thing that we're going to do is change the whole number 6 to a fraction. Do you remember the way that we do that? That's right. We put a 1 underneath the 6, right? And that's going to give us 6 over 1. And what this problem doesn't show here is that next we need to take the reciprocal. They just multiplied across uh, diagonally to get their answer. But it would probably be most helpful when you're learning to do this to go ahead and rewrite this as 1 fourth times one sixths, and that's going to give us one twenty-fourth, and that doesn't need to be reduced at all, okay? So then the next one is three-fourths divided by one one-hundredths, right? So, the, so what we need to do is take the reciprocal of the fraction to the right, change the sign to a multiplication sign, and again, we would then write this as 3 fourths times 100 over 1. 
that would be the reciprocal. And then when we do the multiplication, we get 300 over 4. And 300, uh, it can be divided by 4 equally 75 times. And so we would need to reduce that because that's an improper fraction and we don't want to leave that as an answer. And that would give us an, a final answer of 75. So let's look at some common equivalents. Now, before we get into this topic, let's review some common measurements, all right? So here we have one yard equals three feet, one foot equals 12 inches, one tablespoon equals three teaspoons, one pound equals 16 ounces, a gallon equals four quarts, a quart equals two pints, a pint equals two cups, and one cup equals eight ounces. Okay, so we're gonna use that table. All right, so fractions are common in the measurement system that we use every day, right? We use fractions in time, such as a half an hour, or seven and a half minutes, or four and a half hours. We can also use fractions for our household measurements, such as one and one half cups, or a half a teaspoon, or three pints, as well as in weights in pounds and ounces, such as three quarter and one half ounces, or 12 and one half ounces. Using addition or multiplication, we can then convert fractions between these units. For example, let's say the doctor orders one and one half quarts of medical preparation before he scheduled a CT scan. So the patient uses a cup to measure the liquid. How can the patient consume the proper amount of liquid if they are using a cup, right, instead of quarts? So let's work through this example, all right? We have, uh, we know that one cup is equal to four quarts. So we're gonna, we, we're gonna set that up. We're gonna draw a line. One quart is equal to four cups. All right, there's four cups in one quart, okay? And then how many cups, that's going to be our X. We want to find out how many cups does the patient need, remember, because they're using a cup and not quarts, all right? So that's our unknown. So we're going to set X cups on the bottom. You want, you want your quarts to be on the same, um, in the same place and you want your cups to be in the same place. So you can see here how they set quarts are both in the numerator and cups are both in the denominator. All right, so then we are going to multiply one and a half quarts times four cups to get our answer. Remember, we're solving for an unknown. So essentially we multiply diagonally. We can change the one and a half Remember, we can make it an improper fraction by multiplying one times two and adding one, right? So that gives us three halves. And then we can change the four into a fraction by adding a one underneath it. And so now we just multiply straight across and that gives us three times four is 12. And in the denominator, 2 times 1 is 2, and we can reduce 12 halves. 2 will go into 12 exactly 6 times, and that leaves us with our 6 cups. All right, reading a ruler. So measurements on English rulers are related to fractions, and we read them as fractions. So in this example, a ruler is marked in eighths. So each mark is an eighth of an inch. So the fractions represented by the markers are moving from left to right, one eighth, one fourth, three eighths, one half, five eighths, three fourths, and seven eighths. Remember, you can, if it helps you, you can write above one eighths, two eighths, three eighths, four eighths, five eighths, six eighths, seven eighths, right? What, what they've done with the quarter and the half and the three quarter is they've reduced those fractions. So um, two eighths 
remember we can reduce that to one fourth, right? And four eighths, we can reduce to one half. Okay, so they've just reduced those down. Um, and then when we get to the very last mark on the right, that would be eight eighths. And remember that gives us one whole. Okay, um, some other rulers are marked in sixteenths of an inch. Um, and so we, um, we can do the same thing. One sixteenths, two sixteenths, but we can reduce two sixteenths to one eighth, three sixteenths, four sixteenths, remember would be a quarter, and so on and so forth. Thank you everyone for listening to this lecture. I hope that you found it helpful and I look forward to answering any questions that you might have in our upcoming lecture. Thank you.